Hello and welcome to the second My Jericho of 2021. There's plenty more to come. If you want to find out what, go to myjericho.co.uk, which is our, our brand new website. That'll tell you all there is to come. You just have to click on that, click on Eventbrite to book and click on YouTube to watch. Today we're delving back into Jericho history with uh, the local historian, Mark Davis, the, the man who used to live on Canal Boat but now lives in, in Osley Mead. He's going to take us through another slice of Jericho history. So over to you, Mark. Uh, right, thanks, John. Um, yes, okay, so just to explain, uh, this was in essence the talk that I gave uh, in the Church of St Barnabas last February. Um, we, it was one of several uh, talks and uh, scheduled events which were designed to celebrate the church's 150th uh, anniversary of opening. Um, only the three talks in the end happened uh, because of um, uh, reasons I don't need to explain. But um, a number of people, there was quite a good turnout at the church, but uh, here you are, this is, um, I haven't changed it very much, just a little bit. Uh, and we'll just go through, uh, as you can see, um, uh, a section about the the way the suburb began and uh, then more about the church and then the canal towards the end, in fact, if I remember rightly. And uh, John will just sort of um, uh, ask a few questions in between those few sections. Uh, right, let's hope I have control. Oops, yes, great. So uh, you should hopefully, all of you at home, uh, now see uh, the second slide, which takes us way back uh, to when this was uh, just open fields, really, bordering w w one of the uh, many braiding streams of the River Thames, uh, the one that we today call the Castle Mill Stream. Um, the area was just uh, described as 20 acre. That's the earliest sort of um, specific name that uh, we can find to it. It got um, a reference as part of Walton Manor in the Doomsday Book. Uh, then was transferred to Osney Abbey, um, having uh, passed before that to uh, St George's, that's the um, St. the chapel in, in the castle, in Oxford Castle. And then uh, 1541, as part of the uh, dissolution of the monasteries, um, Henry VIII uh, very generously gave it to his doctor, George Owen, who was a uh, um, uh, an Oxford, uh, or had been formerly a, a, an Oxford student himself. Um, Owen going to an awful lot, he got Godstow and Osney areas and uh, and all of that site of 20 acre. But that's all sort of way in the past and where it becomes more interesting is uh, that 1571 date when uh, it passed to another private individual, uh, Thomas Furs. Now he's described as a singing man of Christchurch, uh, also the uh the proprietor of uh, what was called furries or furs inn in the high street which in essence became later the bear inn and that has um an ongoing significance for jericho uh it wasn't this specific building but um uh the the, the original bear bear inn the one that fur, fur, furs owned uh was uh directly up the street if you like uh, on the high street uh, right through until 1801. It was a huge place at, at that time. Um, 30 rooms and enough stabling for 30 horses, uh, a coaching inn. And the horses is important because all of these inns needed uh, some meadow land, essentially, or ideally that's what they wanted, uh, in order to, I think, not so much um, keep the horses on, but to grow the hay that they could then feed to the horses that were regularly passing through. So you have Angel and Greyhound Meadow, for instance, still to this day uh, associated with the Angel Hotel and the uh, the Greyhound in the High Street. So uh, the bear that you're looking at was, the, was originally just the ostler's house to that much bigger inn. Um, and it's the reason that and, and the reason that it then becomes important to Jericho is because that bear name is then uh, associated with that meadowland I've shown you 20 acre uh, then subsequently gets a bit divided up now I won't dwell too long on this uh, on the detail of this particular slide because there's too much of it probably to take in but I've highlighted what are important here 
Um, the earliest reference we have to the name Jericho, uh, that's in uh, Anthony Wood's diary of 1668, uh, and he writes of going to Jericho Gardens with uh, somebody called John Stevens. Now, Stevens, as you'll see if you go down to 1782 there, he was the, he became subsequently, uh, obviously his, his descendant, not him himself, uh, became the um, the leaseholder of the land, which was still all in the possession of the first family. Um, then from the St. Thomas's Church, because it was part of the St. Thomas St. Thomas's Parish, uh, Jericho, all through this period, uh, from the St. Thomas's Church's Church Warden's accounts, uh, we get this reference to Bear Mead, and that's because clearly the first family who were running the Bear Inn uh, wanted to keep uh, their name attached to the meadowland uh, on which Jericho subsequently was built. So um, I think I won't say anything more there that, you know, this this is record, recorded and people can go back and look at the detail. But the Stevens family were still uh, associated right through to the early 19th century, which is when we start to get a bit more uh, of a, uh, a detailed account of uh, the succession, uh, what was happening to uh, the fields, uh, Great Bear Meadow or Great Bear Mead and Little Bear Mead. Um, the, that Jericho, that first reference by Anthony Wood of 1688 is, um, uh, is clearly um, uh, the, the, to, to the, the public house of, um, of what is more or less on the site of today's Jericho Tavern, and it's that which gives the suburb its name. Then in 1818, uh, this advert, for instance, where um, the pub then gets separated. Up until that time, you had Jericho House uh, with its sort of market gardens, but then also those fields, and that came as one kind of entity. But 1818, it starts to change because uh, we have a uh, the pub being set separately, even though the whole thing is being advertised here, I get the impression that what happened uh, at this auction is that the public house was purchased because we have a publican uh, of that year, um, Mary Higgins, and then the fields themselves then continued in the first family ownership. Um, and at this point, then soon after rather, uh, the expansion of the city, uh, particularly uh, the, catalyst, the particular catalyst being uh, the Oxford University Press, these fields start to become valuable real estate and the first family uh, realised that. Uh, in fact, they, the, nobody was local. They, they were all living a, a long, long way from Oxford. Uh, certainly the, the main uh, landowner in the family was uh, Peter Wellington Furs and he auctioned off all of these sites. Um, you can see from this St. Giles map, so there's Wal uh, sorry, there's Walton Street. I, I'm not sure if you're seeing my cursor or not, but um, uh, Walton Street is running right down the middle. Jericho Gardens is uh, designated separately within St. Giles Parish, but the rest of it is then in the parish of St. Thomas's. Um, and in that map, you've got down the bottom you've got, um, or towards the bottom, you've got the outline of the press. The land had been purchased, but the building had not yet started. But, you know, in anticipation, then all of these fields, the Great and Little Bear Meadows, were being auctioned off down uh, towards the canal. Uh, but the press was undoubtedly uh, a big influence in the desirability and the rationale for people to want to build. Uh, the, the Great Little Bear Meadows were still very much flood prone, those those meadows down towards the canal, uh, higher up towards Walton Street, then building, that's where the building commenced. And so this is taken from uh, the ledger book of the press, and it's an abstract of the, the general expenses. So um, again, I won't dwell on the detail, I've highlighted Carter there uh, with the red arrow, iron founder, who provided the window frames, uh, rails in front of the building and some stoves. Now Carter is the man who established uh, what subsequently became known as Lucy's Ironworks. He had tran he transferred from Summertown to 
uh, the Jericho site where uh, Lucy's subsequently grew to be a very big major local employer of course uh, in 1825 this same year and it may well be therefore that um, it was the incentive of getting this contract with the university press which encouraged him to make uh, that particular move away from Jericho and down right next to the canal there's a, a strong logic uh, to that of course when you're moving heavy materials around um, but there you are. So here is the, the lucky chap who um, inherited all of that, that land, Peter Wellington Furs, who at the time, I forget exactly where, I think he was living in Devon, Devon actually, that's where the family were. So, you know, there was no point in hanging on to the property. So he sold it on to the university uh, along with those auctioned plots. Um, so then we get to still a bit of a bit of an impression this is an idealized view from a bit later but it gives you the impression the press completed largely by 1830 and the books being published properly by about 1832 radcliffe observatory here uh, there's an, a, an indication here of jericho house it's all a bit sort of jumbled and out of proportion but it's it gives you that impression from the canal of the meadowland which uh, slowly over uh, the next decades uh, the press was the stimulus for and i'll just finish this section therefore oops uh, with oops with um uh, it's not a terribly good map i'm sorry about that but it's um uh, it, it, is a, it is a very fine one in uh, its original form this one on the right uh, which shows in the dark um um, quadrangle here of the university press it shows quite clearly the uh, the major part of the building clustering around it to the north and to uh, the west um, the market gardens which were <coughs> still Jericho gardens in essence uh, all divided up as allotment plots uh, what else are we looking at? Uh, up towards the top, up near the canal, you've got, um, well, right, right at the top by the canal, you've got a little inlet. That's uh, the Ward family's boat building firm. Uh, I will come on and talk about the Ward family in a moment or two, because they were hugely important in the creation of St Barnabas Church as well. And then uh, the ironworks just below them, just to the south of them. Uh, that had expanded by this time and was no longer in the possession of the Carters, uh, but um, some other people who pre, who, who sort of um, came before uh, the Lucy family took over. And this map does also show uh, the braiding water of the <coughs> Castle Mill stream to the left. And the reason for the, you know, the open fields really was because of the propensity to flooding. That was true right through to the 1870s, the, the detailed Ordnance Survey map of uh, 1876 or so shows liable to flooding written right across that area still. And that uh, sort of, um, that, that, pro that propensity to flooding was also uh, problematic in terms of generating uh, illnesses, uh, cholera in particular, hence the map on the left, uh, which is part of a, a study of um, different illnesses which were occurring in Oxford and Jericho was, uh, was certainly uh, a place you wouldn't rush to live in if you had any sort of um, health issues. So, so Mark, just uh, if we can just summarise in three lines so far. So a field given, given away by, to somebody's doctor, a pub was built, lots and lots of land, and then Oxford University Press turned up and transformed it. Is that sort of a good summary of the first oh, 500 years of Jericho history, or is, is there a bit more to it than that? I think, yes, I think that will do, because it was just open fields. I, I haven't discovered anything untoward occurred. You know, you have the canal. I haven't even really mentioned the canal, of course, uh, which was uh, before, long before the press. But I think the canal didn't really have that much influence in terms of the creation of the suburbs. Subsequently, it did, of course, but uh, because of the flooding, the, you know, the flood prone nature of the land. Yes, I think that's a fair summary. So w when was the canal built and, and what for? Uh, well, it passed along the, the shall I just go back one? Um, 
or uh, I'm not sure what people are seeing now. Actually, uh, are they seeing a blank screen? Or are they? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll leave it at that then. Um, so, um, seventy. Well, it was completed right through into Oxford in 1790. It has taken about 21 years from Coventry, and coal really was the the principle for Oxford. Anyway, coal was what. Oxford really wanted. Uh, we are a long way from the nearest coal field uh, and from the nearest port and uh, that was by far the, the principal uh, product coming into Oxford. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that in, in a moment or two but, uh, but do uh, bear in mind you. that that was, that was 1790. Uh, the press didn't even look, they weren't even interested until 1825, that's uh, 35 years later. So the canal in the sense of uh, establishing the suburb uh, played no part at all, I would say. Just to ask a very naive question, when it was fields, what, what was cultivated on them? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that properly. When, 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 when it was open fields, what was cultivated on them? What crops were there on them? Oh, I, I, again, there's no there's no information that I've found. I think it was just grazing land, uh, as I say, uh, you know, for, for hay for horses and probably for stabling horses. That image uh, of, um, uh, of 1851 does show a few cattle on it, and that may well be uh, a possibility to uh, sheep perhaps as well. Uh, in, in my previous talk, I did, that's right, I was, um, yeah, I was coming across pigs, wasn't it? It was pigs that were had been banned from Jericho uh, at some point, uh, which is much to the relief of um, of the local people. So I think it was just uh, just livestock of that sort, not arable in any way. Okay, uh, we move on now. The Blue Sky Show, Blue Sky Mem shows. Will you move on to, to the next section, please? So uh, the next section then, yeah, is to do uh, with the churches. This was the reason to um, kind of put this talk together uh, for the anniversary of the church. So its predecessor uh, was St. Paul's, which uh, is still standing, of course, as Freud's today uh, on Morton Street, uh, more or less opposite uh, the university press. Uh, it was, that was constructed in 1835 to 6. So again, you know, the, the stimulus of the press itself was probably an influence. As the suburb was expanding, uh, there was no nearby church and therefore uh, there was an you know, obvious need for that. So it was built, um, so in, the, in that mid 1830s period when uh, the population was estimated at about 1600 people uh, the church had a capacity of 630 and a few years later anyway uh, we know that because of a, a census that was done in 1851 when all the churches were asked to uh, name their capacity and their average number of uh, people attending and the response from St Paul's was that there were on occasions as many as 600 people which is a huge number to pack into uh, what is a relatively small church. The, uh, the need therefore for uh, a bigger and larger one was quite apparent fairly early on I think uh, but it did take until uh, 1868 or thereabouts for uh, the idea to of, of what became St Barnabas Church to actually uh, take full, um, uh, you know, full, uh, to, to, to become a, a, a full reality, by which time, as you can see, the population of Jericho had risen to about 4,000. Um, then, oops, yes, uh, sorry, I'm just struggling a bit. Okay, so uh, where to put a new church? Well, uh, by this time, most of the slightly upper upper level uh, land that was formerly the fields of Jericho had been built on. There weren't a lot of empty spaces and the, the housing, as you can still see today, it was fairly densely packed in. So going down towards the church, that was, sorry, down towards the canal, that was where uh, the open space was that would enable a larger building to be constructed. And so here we've got this plan from 1868, by which time the church had been, uh, you know, it was well underway. Um, it was built on land provided by the Ward family. Now, the Wards were uh, coal merchants, boat builders, uh, boat owners, 
uh, over three generations, they became very influential and very wealthy. And the wards uh, provided the land for the church, uh, as well as owning the two other areas that you can see, the coloured areas, uh, which are, in essence, the, area, you know, the, the areas that we are still discussing as being uh, empty and available uh, for the modern uh, development of a boatyard, a piazza and so on. So the ward family do deserve uh, a lot of credit, I think, because they were good and, and principled philanthropists in many ways. And uh, I do hope that their name can get preserved in uh, the new development because you, could, you, you would struggle to find it uh, commemorated anywhere today. Uh, there is uh, William Ward, the, the, the sort of the, the eldest of the third generation of the family who had these canal associations. So um, I don't think I'll dwell too much on, on them at this point. Uh, it's sufficient just to know that, just to sort of point to them as a, an example really of a, of a family for whom the Industrial Revolution was uh, a gateway to greater wealth, greater respectability, uh, the kind of positions of power that up until then had really been um, in the gift only of a, a rather, you know, rather small number of people uh, who relied on nepotism uh, more than their own wits. Uh, by uh, investing in the canal, by working hard on the canal and by uh, visualising and uh, exploiting the different opportunities that the canal presented, then this family uh, grew to be both wealthy and influential. Uh, so Ward himself was mayor, as you can see, uh, on two occasions. But they were, as I say, also philan uh, philanthropic. Um, it's the wards who I pointed out that boatyard up at this Walton Well Road uh, bridge, which was originally a lift bridge. This this is a really precious image. I've never uh, found any other images of the uh, boat building uh, yard here, and we are of course campaigning to get a boat building facility back in Jericho, let's call that Jericho, uh, it was described as Jericho, Greater Jericho going up that far, right next to the uh, ironworks that William Carter uh, created. Um, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a strong logic there of course, uh, boat building, iron hulls uh, at the time and uh, an ironworks right next door, uh, the two had a, a very helpful uh, symbiosis uh, I'm pretty sure. Um, yep, yeah, so that's rare. If anybody, I might just make a plea actually. Uh, this, is a, this is an image that um, is, a photo, is, is a photograph, it's not the original. Uh, I've no idea where the original painting done by H. Jones, who I think almost certainly was an employee of the ironworks. His name does appear in the census as that. Um, the photograph was taken for uh, some uh, centenary exhibition uh, 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 in the town hall, I think it was. So this is the this image I've taken from the photograph of the painting, and where the original is, I just absolutely love to know. So if anybody does know, uh, please get in touch. So uh, the Ward family very important in terms of the church because they provided the land. Uh, the people who provided the funds for the fabric of the church, Thomas Coombe and Martha Coombe. Let's just say a little bit about them and uh, the way that that progressed. Ed uh, Coombe was the um, superintendent of the Oxford University Press, uh, for those of you that uh, weren't, aren't familiar. Um, and while he was prepared to pay for the fabric of the church, uh, there was still a, a requirement, very sensibly, for upkeep. He wasn't going to necessarily uh, be able to fund that forever. So. Uh, there was a public appeal which uh, appeared in several different versions of this uh, endowment where uh, long lists of people who actually paid, actually this is, why is that gone a bit strange, sorry, uh, maybe, I hope it's, I hope that's showing all right for everybody else, I'm, I'm, my, my screen is showing to, we can, we, we can see it uh, fine. Okay, good. Okay, well, you're seeing this better than I am by the time. Um, so, 
Um, yes, so, uh, the, the, I mean, the important text to, to take out of this, so this would have been issued probably in 1867, maybe 1868, where, again, the, the Ward family I mentioned, they've most liberally given a site, and a gentleman, uh, very modestly, uh, Coombe not uh, revealing his own uh, identity uh, is building a church and you see this long list of you know quite substantial donations in fact by a lot of people uh, which I'll just pick out a couple now that's better uh, to people dear to my own heart um, so the Reverend C. L. Dodgson of Christchurch uh, better known as Lewis Carroll um, so he gave a, a reasonably large amount and then his close colleague and friend also from Christchurch Lydon there also this photograph taken uh, of Lydon by uh, Charles Dodgson with his uh, photographer's hat on and the reason I've just picked out those two out of a long list of names I might have mentioned is that uh, they both went off to Russia together uh, it's something that I'm desperate to, um, uh, to find out more about and actually to uh, I think it's a story well worth telling that the only time that Lewis Carroll ever ever went abroad uh, was in 1867 he went with his friend Lydon and uh, they went all the way to Russia and not just to Moscow and St Petersburg but uh, well further east than that but let me not uh, divert too much uh, except I will just slightly throw in a little bit of a, a commercial break here and just mention that uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Lewis Carroll is one of my particular topics in the Oxford context and uh, I've written a book Alice in Waterland which looks at the way that the river uh, and indeed Jericho uh, because the book was published in Jericho by Coombe uh, you know it's all about uh, those kind of Oxford connections oh dear now what's going on here Sorry, um, I'm not sure what you're seeing now, but I'm finding it tricky to move my screen on. John? Um, well, it was, 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 you, you, you. Hello, perhaps we come to you for a little while, uh, Mark. Hello? Uh, you are, yes, uh, my screen has gone a bit weird, I'm afraid. No don't worry, let's get let's uh, come to you and, and let, let, let's come to you. So look, uh, six hundred people in the church. Father Christopher would be would be in heaven if he thought he could get that in survival from me. Where did the six hundred people out of a population of eighteen hundred? That's one in three. Um, yes, in, in heaven is a very good expression, I suppose, isn't it? Um, uh, well, uh, yes, although the church does, you know, it, it, it does uh, even today. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful venue, isn't it? And uh, on occasions you can get very large numbers of people in there. Um, yeah, uh, it was, it was uh, you know, the, the, the need for a much bigger uh, venue, and it wasn't actually all that much bigger. Um, St Barnabas, I think, was designed to take a thousand people, uh, but that's, yeah, that's certainly an improvement. Um, yeah, uh, well, and it feels that much bigger. When was St Paul's deconsecrated? When did it become a wine bar? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I'm afraid. Okay, okay. Uh, let, let's let's move on. Let's move on to the wars. Now they, they haven't really been recognised. Is there a reason for that? There's no streets named after them. Nothing like that in Jericho. Is there a reason why they they're a bit hidden? Um, well, I think they, they never lived in Jericho, and um, I, I mean, I may be wrong. I mean, maybe elsewhere in in Oxford there is some recognition, but I, I don't think so. I, you know, I have, I've ch sort of tried. Uh, the, the, the only place in in the Jericho area, the, the, there's a drinking fountain in Walton Well Road, uh, which uh, William Ward did provide, and uh, his name is uh, inscribed on that. But it's, um, you know, it's a bit... It's a bit obscure, isn't it? And it's not really um, easily found. Not, not, so. not, not much of a, of, a, of a tribute after a lifetime of work for the area, is it, to have a drinking fountain named after you? Or <laughs> there. Well, uh, no, no, but, uh, it's, but it's... Moving on, why, why did Thomas Coombe want to build a church? Was it for his workers? Was it for people's souls or what? Um, yes, I think so. He was a highly religious man, it would seem. Um, he uh, was 
he was certainly sympathetic to the Oxford movement, uh, which St Barnabas became, you know, very, very high church. Um, he was um, he was actually a church warden at St Paul's, and perhaps thought, well, you know, I, I, yes, I think he he did have he, he he did have a good reputation for being very concerned for his workers, uh, both in a physical and um, uh, a spiritual sense. I would say, as did the wards. Indeed, they were the, the ward family were very influential in getting the canals, the canal companies, to close their locks on Sundays so that the workers on the canal had no excuse not to go to church. Uh, you know, this Sunday working idea was, um, you know, was something that the wards were very keen on. Uh, and I suppose the last thing is that Thomas and Martha Coombe had no children, but they had an awful lot of money. So uh, it was a good opportunity for um, some sort of, um, you know, uh, some sort of immortality as well, even though they were quite modest about it, I have to say. Spool, spool back a little bit. You used the phrase uh, the Oxford movement. What was that? Yeah, so I may get in slightly awkward waters there if I, um, uh, I, I, you know, I don't pretend to understand it in great detail, but it, essentially it was uh, uh, a movement started in Oxford where the uh, desire was to shift the Anglican church more back towards the um, the rituals and the uh, ceremonials of the Catholic Church. So uh, St Barnabas came a bit of a butt of jokes in that respect in some ways that, um, uh, yes, uh, you know, it, it, it was a little bit notorious, let's say, uh, because of its zealousness in that respect, and St Thomas's as well. Uh, we may come on to that. I can see my screen's cleared a bit now. Oh, good. Well, and just to, just uh, talking about commercial breaks, perhaps I should have a little commercial break and just promote what's coming up. Ne next week, we, we've got the editor of the Oxford Times, the brand new editor of the Oxford Times, um, t talking for the first time about what he's planning to do with the paper, how he's managed to save it. This is a unique opportunity to actually uh, go face to face with, a, with a, a media mover and shaker. That's next Wednesday. The Wednesday after that, there is going to be John Howson, who is the county councillor. But last year, him and his twin brother took a trip around Europe by train. They're train buffs. And they've just, they've just done a book about it called, called Twin Tracks. Do, do sign up for this. It's another side of John Howson. And the week after that, I don't know if you have a slide for that, we, 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 will, we will have Alex, Alex Hollinsworth, who's lived in, in Jericho for 30 years, talking about his Jericho. Meanwhile, back to the history of Jericho. Over to you again, Mark. Well, let's hope so. Um, yes, I, I've skipped on a little bit, but no, let's, let's, we've, we've talked about this already. So um, um, Coombe had also been influenced undoubtedly by his travels in Italy. And so this, here's a letter written to Holman Hunt, one of the pre-Raphaelite uh, artists that he um, championed, um, talking about as, as the church was being built, that's at the end of 1868. Uh, it is the first perfect basilica in this country uh, and modelled uh, on the Cathedral of Torcello. Uh, a photograph of Coombe there was taken by Charles Dodgson, uh, Lewis Carroll, uh, again showing his really brilliant uh, photographic skills. And no, it's oh, it is happening. It's not happening on my screen, but I can see it is happening on we, yours. We, 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 we can hear it. We can see it. Yeah, uh, that's so weird. Okay, um, trouble with that is that I right. Okay, um, so uh, there's there's a bit of a progression of how the uh, canal company. Uh, so yeah, from the from the from the canal company correspondence, just showing the interrelationship between the church, really, uh, the builders uh, bringing in stuff by canal. Uh, and unloading it onto the site there. You can see some of the loads of rubble there. Um, what else? Um, yes, the great injury to the canal from boys throwing large quantities of gravel into the uh, canal. Um, boys will be boys, and uh, that's even to this day, there's just an irresistible urge, isn't there, with uh, uh, all people, not necessarily just boys, to uh, throw stuff uh, into uh, water. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, and so here is just a, an image of the completed church. Uh, the campanile came a little bit after the main body of the church, and you can see in this image, uh, which was done 
in uh, when and when Coombe, Coombe died in 1872. Um, that it's separate. Uh, nowadays, if you look at the church, it's uh, that gap there between the, the main church and the tower has been uh, uh, added, has been sort of filled in. And the top of the, the church tower is, is much more pointed in, in its original form. It was um, reduced in height uh, at a later date. And when I gave uh, the previous talk about uh, Miss Hawtrey's scrapbook, uh, I think I showed this image as well and showing this wonderful view down the or up rather cardigan street to the radcliffe observatory you won't make it out in the slide itself but um it is to me a huge tragedy that the new development that's proposed uh, will uh, mean that that view gets blocked off and um i think uh i still sincerely hope that we can uh, salvage that view somehow by having slightly less housing and a bigger piazza and just finally, uh, on the churches section, uh, this was when I was going to stop and we talked, but, we, but we've done that already. Uh, the Ward family uh, uh, were the people who provided the funds for this floating chapel down at Hythe Bridge Street. And uh, it provided some, um, some, it provided both uh, religious services, but also education, Sunday schools and so on, not just for the children of the boats, but also for the children of St. Thomas's. And coincidentally or not, uh, it sank in 1868. That's the same, exactly the same year that the new St. Barnabas Church was being uh, built. It's all part of St. Thomas's Parish still. And uh, the, the, the floating chapel there had been going for 30 years. Um, it's, uh, oh, oh, it's wonderful. It's not unique in the country, but it's pretty unusual that such a thing was established. And again, it reflects on the philanthropy of the Ward family and their concern for the spiritual well-being of the people who worked for them, uh, that they were uh, willing to provide that um, rather amazing uh, structure there. Oops, okay. So we'll... um... But back back to the two of us, if we can. Uh, uh, just, um, I'm hoping that on March the third, uh, the vicar, the, the Father Christopher, will be doing a sort of uh, a, a brief history of St Barnabas, and indeed he'll explain the Oxford movement and what it all means. Him and maybe a par another parishioner or two. So, if you want to find out more, come back again on on, on March the third uh, at five thirty, and we'll have that. But meanwhile, on, onwards, Mark, to your next section, please. Okay. If you if you want to find out about future events, go to myjericho.co.uk, which is a, a brand new website. Or go to YouTube and uh, and you can subscribe. It'll it'll everything is there. So every event is out there for Eventbrite and also how to how to look at it on YouTube. Over to you again, Mark. Uh, okay. Um, good. Yes. Okay. So I can see that you've got uh, a few literary uh, associations and uh, other comments, really, which just reflect on uh, on the reputation of Jericho, uh, which was not a good one, essentially. But then, you know, I think almost all, if you if you read any sort of fiction written by uh, written by almost always by people from the university, then virtually any suburb you care to mention gets a pretty poor press um, in you know ways that you might <laughs> find unsurprising really. But the name Jericho is quite interesting uh, in its own right. So there you get that little excerpt from uh, Tobias Smollett's Peregrine Pickle. There's a little bit of that novel uh, is set in Oxford very early, so that's mid uh, 18th century, when uh, there is this expression used by one of the characters, drive, damn ye, drive to the gates of Jericho and uh, ends of the earth. And um, that's a kind of common expression, you know, from a bi biblical reference, clearly, uh, which you do find quite often appears in different um, Oxford novels as well. And I think the writers are usually uh, bearing in mind that Jericho, our Jericho, uh, also did have a bad reputation. So uh, people uh, locally reading these novels would get that kind of double joke. Uh, because here, not from fiction, but from, again, this uh, wonderful... Um, oral history that uh, Miss Hawtrey compiled in the 1950s uh, is Montague Brown, this young boy who uh, couldn't resist coming out to Jericho despite the warnings uh, to watch the church being built. 
And as he said, he and his brother had to keep to the middle of the road and pay no attention to anything they heard or saw on the way. Furthermore, on no account were they to go at night, for they would probably have rat's tails and oyster shells thrown at them. Um, then uh, R.D. Blackmore uh, from Crips the Carrier. Again, I think I probably made that reference to in the previous talk because Miss Hawtrey had um, uh, clearly read this novel. Uh, Blackmore is more fam most famous probably for the novel Lorna Doon set on Exmoor. But uh, his Crips the Carrier has Jericho as one of the scenes. Uh, the place was lonely, dark and villainous. Footpads still abounded. And then... Uh, again, a, a, a quote from reality rather than fiction, even though it is by a novelist, uh, by Thackeray, who uh, was canvassing to be uh, Oxford's MP in 1857. And uh, because of the, uh, the huge influence of, of the boatmen, you know, uh, these were dynasties, really, uh, large families of boatmen who intermarried and the sort of elders of the clan, as it were, would have a lot of power and whoever they put their vote to, then that would, you know, probably attract another hundred votes from all of their close relations. So uh, Thackeray was was uh, convinced to go down and talk to the uh, some of the boatmen uh, and failed in his um, uh, sort of entreaties, evidently, because he, even though he presumably sort of crossed their palms with silver, uh, they sort of voted for the other chap. And so he claimed he'd gone down into Jericho and fallen among thieves. Uh, then this drink map um, is quite an interesting one from 1883 held at the Bodleian uh, where it shows the huge number of drinking establishments in Jericho. You know, all of this stuff then adds to uh, the reputation. Similarly, as a, a, a red light district, I don't think there's any clear evidence about that, although there is a, a, a book in the Bodleian again where the proctors listed all of the people that uh, and locations that their students were forbade to go to and uh, Jericho did contain a, a very large number compared to many other places it's true to say. Um, then uh, we talked briefly about the canal so I'll just um, uh, just uh, re-emphasize that then that the canal went right down into the city passing by Jericho it was probably being dug there in about 1789 and again it was land from that same family the first family that the canal company bought uh, that stretch of meadowland that was essentially the bottom of their fields uh, through which the canal was built for the terminus to be opened uh, where the Worcester Street car park is in uh, 17 uh, 90 and then subsequently uh, because the canal proved so commercially popular with such a lot of movement of traffic on it uh, the canal company then purchased the site which Nuffield College now stands on and uh, there's a, a photograph of uh, how it looked in the uh, 1930s I think just before uh, Nuffield himself uh, bought both sites for his uh, college, his college which he hoped would bridge the gap between industry and intellect. He himself, of course, had never uh, had any uh, a real substantial education, William Morris, uh, Lord Nuffield, and um, so that, that idea of bridging the gap between industry and intellect is uh, uh, an interesting one in the Oxford context. Um, and the canal as I again said a bit earlier, uh, it was really quite remote from Jericho in its formative years. Uh, it became important subsequently as the suburbs spread across the meadows, uh, but still created a bit of a barrier really uh, in the sense that uh, as the railway age kicked in and the canals became much less important, uh, the canal presented a barrier really it, was a, it meant that people could not get easily across to the railway station without sort of going either down into uh, the city or going north to Hythe Bridge uh, sorry to Walton Well so this ferry then became a very important uh, public transport entity and lasted for well over a hundred years really the indent uh, in there that where the this this ferry boat was held uh, you could still see until fairly recently uh, it's a bit of a hazard in fact uh, for college cruisers uh, when they were operating but it was still there uh, certainly within the last 15 years perhaps even the last 10 years and um, it took until well there was a campaign to get a bridge 
for, for a very, very long time by the, the residents of Jericho, uh, right through from the 1870s. Uh, but it took until 1972 for that bridge actually to be uh, done for the Jericho people to get their wish, um, which is the bridge that you can still cross into Mount Place to this day. Um, right. Oh, sorry. Um, now I can see everything's frozen again. I'm trying to move move on. And if, you, it's if we not can, really having... uh, uh, tell, tell us about the pubs. Tell us about the pubs. How many pubs were there, and why so many? Um, why so many pubs? I don't know that it. I think it's just the, in essence, the the the, the grid pattern of that of, of Jericho, you know, it didn't grow organically like other suburbs did. Uh, I think the fact that you had so many corners <laughs> uh, and so many streets, really, uh, compared to many other of the uh, suburbs of St Thomas and Ebbs, St Aldate's, and, and so on, uh, probably, and it was also that much more remote. Uh, remember, um, uh, Jericho even right through to the. Uh, 1850s was had this nickname of um, Botany Bay because it was considered to be uh, because Worcester College, sorry, was had the nickname of Botany Bay because it was considered to be so remote from the other colleges. So Jericho was even more remote, um, and therefore uh, there weren't perhaps so many there weren't so many other opportunities for people just to go to the more established uh, pubs and inns that were uh, uh, in the suburbs closer to the city. So and a lot of these were just beer shops. You know, this would be home brew, just people sort of uh, brewing their own. Um, so yeah, there were a lot, but um, I, I suppose the other thought, the other point really? is that water supply in Jericho was probably less uh, less safe than in some of the other parts, the slightly higher parts of Oxford, and so drinking ale, even a weak ale, would have been um, uh, a safer option than uh, some of the water that was supplied. But today uh, there are only six, you know, today there are only six pubs. So you know, today there are only six pubs. So I just wonder where they got the custom mm. from. Yeah, well, I passed. Um, uh, uh, you know, clearly it was it was there. I, 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 yeah, who knows? Um, it was it was it was there. As I say, water probably and a lack of other other options. Uh, also, uh, most people in Jericho were were doing very hard manual labour, um, either in the press or on the railway uh, or elsewhere, and um, you know probably felt they jolly well deserved a drink at the end of the day. So they either went to church um, or to the pubs. I mean, and you can still see the signs of the pubs, of course, on street corners. You, there are pub signs on some walls, aren't there? Still, there are. There are. Yes, if you do a, well, if you do a walk around Jericho with me when that's allowed again, um, yes, you can still see uh, many of the private houses uh, still retain um, some of the um, uh, the brewery um, um, logos in their brickwork. Uh, John, my my screen is showing. Uh, a, a good uh, okay. uh, the next slide now it should well, be okay we've got about I hope. 10 minutes move, move yep. on please yep okay good um so just to while we're talking about the canal uh just to sort of round off really and just just to remember that uh, the canal and the church has had this very very strong association right from the beginning uh through the ward family who provided the land through uh, the fact that a lot of the materials were brought down by canal, uh, quite clearly that was a, a sensible thing to do. Uh, but also, uh, inevitably, as time has gone on, simply because uh, the boatyard that uh, became, uh, or the site that became used as a boatyard that you're looking at now, is uh, adjacent to uh, the church. And so uh, there is this physical um, association you know unavoidable one in the sense that uh, they had to uh, be good neighbors to one another and still are indeed of course because uh, the church is uh, has huge vested interest in what happens to that site so when I first moved on to my boat uh, just around the corner from Jericho in 1992 this boatyard here was going strong uh, fact, indeed there were two there was college cruisers and orchard cruisers and uh, on a very regular basis this crane was uh, a crane was brought in and we were able to be craned out uh, to get the hulls done uh, which is exactly 
uh, what uh, needs to be done on a regular basis. And this is the, the big tragedy of the huge long delay from a boating point of view that so many boats are uh, just deteriorating really as we speak because of the delay in being able to um, get out of the water and get the hulls done. That's a really uh, old boat incidentally, that's one of my neighbours, that's a boat called Ben, I've just realised, and that's a high an, an iron hull. Uh, in essence, I think I'm right in saying that it, it, it's, an, it's a 1930s uh, boat, but within that is uh, remnants of a, a late 19th century uh, working boat. So uh, a very historic item uh, being suspended in the air there. Um, the blacksmith's forge there, uh, there's a fairly obvious symbiosis there with horses and uh, the use of horses on the canal and uh, their need for horseshoes. But it was more uh, of a corporation, uh, an Oxford City Council enterprise when it was being used there uh, uh, in, the 19, in the early 19th century. Uh, we are gonna lose that building. Uh, it was only built in the 1930s. It's not hugely historic, uh, but you also, many people will remember the inlet there you can still well, in fact you can still see it it's all boarded up now but that was um, a really useful little um, wet dock and we are more or less in the same location you can just see the church in this uh, lovely illustration uh, to the right there just see the edge of the church we are more or less going to get a, a wet dock in this sort of vague area uh, along with two dry docks in other words docks where the boats can go in uh, water pumped out and then uh, this vital work on the hulls can be uh, done. Um, what are you seeing there? Yep, that's okay. Uh, this absolutely lovely illustration by uh, Jericho resident Valerie Petz, who I'm always grateful to for uh, providing illustrations that I use in my talks, but also some of my publications, including the um, the, the one about Alice, uh, some lovely little uh, vignettes of the uh, different locations on the river uh, that Valerie provided. Uh, again, just, just sort of emphasising the, uh, the interconnection between the, uh, the church and the canal. Um, and again, another view of, of, of this in its heyday, the, uh, uh, the very busy boatyard. Uh, and this sort of crunch moment in 2006 when uh, the boaters in desperation had um, sort of occupied the area, which was just left derelict and useless so um, this was uh, uh, that momentous day really when at huge public expense uh, British waterways uh, who owned the land at that time uh, came in with this crane and evicted the boaters with very little warning and uh, as you can see uh, feelings were from the, the slogan that uh, was painted right across this boat that had been forcibly put in the water some of them before they were ready um, what, what's what's sadly missing from the because the chap in the rowing boat is just uh, blocking out the fact that uh, it doesn't say British waterways, it says brutish waterways. Um, and uh, Philip Pullman uh, has, was influential in uh, the campaign to, uh, and has been ever since, to get the uh, boat yard back again because of his, um, um, his setting of uh, Lyra and uh, the Dark Materials, uh, two series of which, of course, have been on television uh, recently. Um, they, his, his, uh, you know, he had, has a strong vested interest in Jericho, and he has been uh, really superb in our um, campaign to get the boatyard back. And uh, I think, oh, damn it. Uh, uh, talking about Philip Pullman, maybe maybe we come back to you, Mark. It seems to have frozen again. Talking about Philip Pullman, it, um, he, he has been approached, and if he'll answer his emails, we're hoping that he will appear at some point. On, on my Jericho. This is probably a convenient point to break off, isn't it? Because we, we, we can come back another time for another slice of Jericho history. This is a, this is a this series of run and run and run. Um, would you like to do a couple adverts, one for your book and one for your boat? Are you still trying to sell your boat? <laughs> um, no, my screen is okay again, actually. We can just, just, just very quickly uh, 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 Tie, tie this off because okay. um, I just did want, I did want to just mention Betjeman, uh, who was the predecessor of Philip Pullman in the sense of a very important literary figure who chaired this meeting in 1955 and who loved, because this talk was about the church, so let's just finish with the church, uh, he did describe uh, it as the by far the best Victorian 
church in Oxford. And um, somebody, well, actually, perhaps I, if there's a time, yes, there is time, just to, uh, somebody later on in 1985, Jonathan Price, I'm not sure if that's, maybe that might even be the BBC man or the, the TV man, but anyway, he envisages Betjeman coming back to Jericho, and um, this was not in the talk I gave in February. To Canal Street, now I come, burning with eagerness to see St Barnabas, and I'm struck dumb, almost, when it towers over me. Functional high church Byzantine, we've heard about that. You are but rubble trimmed with brick, Blomfield, 1869. So, bless good Barnabas, the pick. So, he's putting words into Betchman's uh, mouth in a sense and just to finish with we, we talked about the high church element of Jude so St Silas says which he describes as the church of ceremonies uh, and there um, yes yeah, so uh, we are running out of time John I suppose and you want to do an advert so I'll just move very quickly on P.D. James who did, who, did, who did live in Jericho if you go back to the P.D. James lived on the canal Yes, indeed. Yes, you know yeah, and she, she worshipped. Well, she worshipped in the church. Yeah, she lived in St John Street, I think. She might have had another another house no, elsewhere. No, no, no. She, 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 no, she lived in Lucy, in Lucy Flats. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, uh, and there's your there's your yes. three books. Which, yes. If you uh, move it, on to your three books, please, please, Mark. Okay. Yep. So, so there you are. Um, so. Uh, as most people, I assume, will be local uh, watching this, uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm even allowed to hand deliver, but if you are interested in any of these, uh, then um, that's a postage included price that I'm putting up there. But uh, you can find out much more about them either at the website or just send me a quick email uh, if any of these titles uh, should interest you. It's the Towpath Walk, uh, which is most connected with the talk I've just given, of course, uh, but the others I'm sure I would hope you would find of interest too. So thank you. Thank you very much. I know you're still trying to sell your boat. Um, um, well, I, um, I, I, the deal is not done, but it's within a week it probably will be. But uh, you know, until it's done, it's it's still available technically. Yeah. Okay. So if you if you'd like to buy a boat in the next week, canal boat, contact Mark there. Right. Thank you very much, Mark. We'll we'll have you back later later on to talk about the 20th century. But meanwhile, next week, if we can, next week we've got the editor of the Oxford Times, Pete Gavin. Who has come from the from from Wiltshire to, to to take it over to hopefully put some life into it and some campaigns into it? He'll be, if you got questions for him, send them to me. I'll ask them to mind. I'm not afraid to ask people questions. The week after that, John Howson, Councillor John Howson, on his trip on his trip around Europe, about closely observed European trains. Come come along and 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 um, and and hear, see that and hear that. He's got lots of nice pictures. And finally, uh, all of these things cost money. So if you if you would like to contribute towards internet costs and other costs to put it on this little series cost there is a there's a bank account i'm crowdfunding those are the details lloyd's bank salt code there and so on any little bit goes towards it but uh, you know it, it we we've spent about 500 pounds so far but thank you very much thank you mark see, see you next week and uh, thank you everybody and let, let's go out with a, a, a whirl again Yoo-hoo!